So I've titled tonight's discussion The Rebbe and the Splitting of the Sea. Now the reason for this title is because, as I mentioned, tonight is the day that the Rebbe, uh, the previous Rebbe passed away. It's also the day that a year after the previous Rebbe passed away, the Rebbe officially accepted the leadership. Now I say officially because unofficially, as soon as the previous Rebbe passed on, the Rebbe became Rebbe. Now it's also, um, that's the day of Jude Shvat. We know that in Judaism, the day starts from, when does the day start from in Judaism? The day before, isn't it? That's right, the, the night, night before. before. Correct. So, in, uh, therefore, tonight we're already starting Yud Shvat, but also tomorrow, the reading of the Torah, for tomorrow's reading, each day of the week we have, we know that the Torah, each portion, is split into seven parts, and therefore the reading for tonight and tomorrow, which would be Yud Shvat, on the day of the Rebbe's uh, acceptance of the leadership and the passing of the previous Rebbe, is the splitting of the sea, and Az Yashir. So I thought that it would be appropriate for us to combine the two. So as I mentioned, it's a Farbrengen. It's not going to be a Shear. So ready for a Farbrengen, I should be properly dressed up a bit more, but maybe I'm a bit, a bit hot today. Um, but for those, for those, yes, Irene. What does Farbrengen mean? Good, good, thank you. I appreciate the question. Farbrengen is generally, uh, it's, there's, there's lots of different ways of, of how you can discuss a Farbrengen. Farbrengen means a coming together. Okay. So in, in uh, Hebrew, they call it a hitvadut, or in English, we can't call it a gathering. But okay. Farbrengen is a unique thing that is something unique to Chabad um, that now the world has more and more adopted, and not just adopted, but realized the need for Farbrengen. Uh, traditionally, the way a, a Fabrengen worked in, in Chabad um, organizations or the way Chabad worked in other, other groups, Hasidic groups, they had something similar, they have something similar which they call a Tish. Uh, but the Fabrengen is, uh, I've got all different ways of how it's done, but generally it's one individual talks um, and says words of inspiration. There's usually food and uh, usually people say Lechayim. And we sing songs. So the purpose of a Farbrengen, unlike a Shear, a Shear is there to study. A Shear, we sit there to study, to learn ideas. A Farbrengen, the purpose of a Farbrengen is to get inspired and to feel a togetherness, to connect. It's more about connection and inspiration. So that's why we will say some words of inspiration and then traditionally um, you would say those words of inspiration and then you'd sing a song. Why do we sing a song between? A, to give us a moment to rest and to absorb the words that we said and to feel that inspiration and to let it settle in. That's the purpose of the Fabrengen. Uh, and traditionally within Chabad Yeshivot, for example, where I would have studied, in, in Chabad circles, they would have uh, uh, Fabrengans many times a year, and specifically on special dates, like the day of a passing of a great Rebbe, or, or the like. And um, on those days, after this, the, the, the regular learning is over, um, at let's say 9 o'clock at night, we would sit around and they'd, they'd gather tables, and, and one of the rabbis would lead, lead a discussion, and uh, there's, there's different forms. Sometimes you do it just amongst friends and everyone just chats and sings and, and kind of expresses the way they're feeling. And uh, it's a chavarshaft. It's an opportunity to connect. And uh, not just... So Chabad realized, or the Chabad Rebbe's and the Hasidim realized that people, it wasn't just good enough for the people to just... Um, just study and to learn, but they also needed to have that opportunity to connect and to feel together. So, we, we, in Chabad, we make, any good day is a good day for a Fabrengen, but we particularly Fabreng on days where something special happened. So, tomorrow night I'll be going to Fabrengen, I know that in Caulfield there are a couple of Fabrengens tonight, but tomorrow I'll be going to Fabrengen in Yeshiva, 
and normally we should be doing this for praying in, in person not on zoom but uh, I just felt that some people are more likely to come if we're on zoom so <laughs> in the current climate but um, that's the concept of Abrangan and that's going to be our discussion tonight. So as I mentioned tonight we're going to focus on the connection between the concept of the spilling of the sea and the day of Yud Shvat, the Rebbe's acceptance of the leadership, the passing of the previous Rebbe. So what's the connection and how does it all relate? So I want to start off with just an interesting story that I recently read and I think it's very appropriate for tonight's discussion. The story is about Ben Gurion that in 1954 he went to um, the US to visit with the then uh, president and uh, have meetings with the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State, who I forget his name at the time, didn't think very highly of this new little fledgling country, uh, state. Um, and um, Ben Gurion was trying to get some new, um, whatever, assistance in some particular way. And uh, the Secretary of State felt that it was not necessarily that important. And he didn't understand, and he turns to Ben Gurion and says, Tell me, why should I help you? What, what do you have to offer? What, what is, what, 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 why do you need a land? And why do I have to, why do you think the United States should be coming? We're the world power. Um, why should we be helping this little brand new state? Um, and Ben Gurion's answer was as follows quite a powerful answer. Now, if the t details of the story are true, that I cannot tell you, but I recently read it, so it could be that it's true at least. But whether it's true or not, the answer is very true. And he said, tell me something, Mr. Secretary. If you were to go up to the average American child, or the average American teenager and ask them, what where did the American country, country of America, start from? What year was it? Uh, what year did you become independent? And what year did you, when did the first boats arrive from England? All the, all the history, which I myself don't really know that much of. I'm actually, I'm actually a citizen of the United States of America. But just so you understand, if you ask the average teenager, how much would they know? And his answer was, in 1954, very little. They would know very low, know very little of their history. Ben Gurion said, "Listen, you say that we're a small little country, brand new, just six years old, and uh, coming just a gathering of people from different small groups of people from hundreds of countries around the world. If you would go up to any of those teenagers." any 15 year old and you ask them tell me 3,000 years ago where were your ancestors at the spring of the sea what happened what happened to them afterwards he said the average teenager Jewish teenager will be able to tell you a lot about their history and where they come from so when we think about the Jewish people as a general whole, we should be thinking about the history, where we come from, and recognizing that we have something really special. And when we think about those special events, without a doubt, what's considered in Jewish history, everything in Jewish history is based on the Exodus. There's two great events, there's three great events. There's the Exodus, and the Exodus is there to go and receive the Torah. And the main preparation for the receiving of the Torah and becoming the Jewish people is one particular event. It's all the events around the Exodus. And there's one culminating event, which is like the major nail in the head of the Exodus. And that's the reading of the spring of the spring of the sea. Why? Why is in a certain degree the splitting of the sea becomes one of the most important elements 
of all of Jewish history. Now, to be honest, there's thousands of reasons and layers upon layers of depths that we can discuss. But I'd like to discuss two or three points for our for Brengen tonight. Point number one. The splitting of the sea was the first time and the main time in history when God revealed himself in nature more than any other time. There was the, the Mount Sinai, God spoke to the Jewish people. But what happened at the splitting of the sea was that God showed us that he is that he is um, controlling nature every single moment, and that he has absolute control over nature. What about the plagues before that? The plagues, the plagues, yes, they, they showed that, but there was something different. And a good point. So let's discuss for a moment. What was the difference between the plagues? And the spinning of the sea. First of all, the Medra says this. The Medra says, Masashif Khara al Hayam Afilu Novi Loira. He says, What a um, what the lowest of even a maid servant to describe, so to speak, somebody that's not necessarily a spiritual person, would have seen at the spinning of the sea, not even the greatest of prophets would have seen in any other time. Why? So he says but there's, 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 there's many reasons, but what was unique about the spinning of the sea is that the spinning of the sea was nature went against itself. So there's miracles, there's different types of miracles. Every, each one of the, um, of the miracles that we had like the plagues, blood, that was something unusual happening within the way the world works. The work is the world. The, word, the, 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 the water turns to blood. It's an incredible miracle. The difference is what happened with the spring of the sea, you made the way that nature works is that water flows downwards. And when the sea split, the water stood up. So this was the first significant element of the setting of the sea. What was unique about it is that God creates nature. And he says to nature, I want you to be in a particular way. So he creates, for example, frogs. And frogs do what frogs do. And that's the second plague. What was the difference by the second plague? There was just a lot of frogs. He creates water and he turned it into blood. He turned it into something else. But when you take something that exists and he makes it change its natural state of being, he didn't turn it into something else. He kept it the same way. It wasn't a stick turning into a snake. This was a major event. First of all, it was much broader seen than all the other ones. And also he made it remain in its state a turn against its regular nature, its regular way of being. Now, why is this important? What, what, what was important about, and there's, there's, sorry, there's a second point, which is the major point, which I wanted to get to in the second, uh, the second idea. The second major point about the spring of the sea is that it's all about changing the way of nature. What it means is as follows. We look, God creates, God created the world and he placed in the world something which we call, we like to call Mother Nature. And we think of Mother Nature as being, so to speak, the self-run mechanism. It's a self-run organism that just runs by itself. The world runs on its own motor, its own engine. It just has this natural way, the solar systems and everything seem to work just the way they should. And once in a while, something seems to be a slight glitch and then we have a natural disaster, but that's also part of nature. That's the way it seems. 
But we know that from the Jewish perspective is that the truth is that behind everything there's really a divine energy that is controlling every single drop of nature. And God puts it and makes it look as though everything is just running normally. But when we open our eyes, we would see that it's not that way. Now, what's the example? So, in general, we talk about this concept as being, there's the, what you see and what you can't see. You know, we as human beings are able to see quite a lot. We, we, we notice quite a lot of what's going on around us. But the truth is that of what we can see, it's a tiny percentage of what's really going on even in our own surroundings. What I mean is that if you were to take, even let's just talk first of all physically, a, Microsoft, uh, a microscope and be able to see what is actually going on in the real minute details, we would see that there's much, much more detail uh, going on within every single detail. And we also understand that everything is, so to speak, has a facade. Everything is covered up. And we know that, you know, a human being on the outside has skin uh, that makes them look presentable in a particular way. But inside, it looks very, totally different. And that's the same way it is within every single part of the physical world. But the truth is that that's only half of the picture. There's a whole second element to what's going on that you can't see not through the greatest microso microscopes, not through the greatest um, telescopes, that you could never see with a physical eye. Not even if you had the most advanced magnifying abilities possible. And that is the spirituality that is with inside that physical concept. There's a whole world of spirituality, of, of godliness that is making that thing exist. So in general, we divide, uh, the, the, the Kabbalistic world divides the world into two parts. There's the hidden world and there's the revealed world. There's, in other words, the physical parts that we see. And even within the physical, there's the part that we don't see. But more importantly, there's the spiritual world, which is called, in, in the terms of Hasidut, is known as Alma de Scalia and Alma de Scassia. The concealed world and the hidden world. Now, the analogy given for this concept is the sea. And, the t and, and Kabbalah says as follows, that we, we as living on earth, see all around we can see all around the physical earth whatever is above ground and above the sea but what's under the ground and what's under the sea we can't see we generally don't see that but there's worlds under the sea there's so much happening and there's as, as, as many billions of creatures as there are above um, above ground and above the water is even more under the sea. So this entire world. So the, so the analogy is like when you look at the sea, if unless you have a submarine or you're going scuba diving, you're going to see, you're not going to see much. So what do you see in the sea? You just see water. But we all know, but because we've heard from other people or we ourselves have gone down scuba diving and we've seen that there's a whole world underground. So the world underground, the underground world, the undersea world is, is representative of the spiritual worlds. That spirituality that exists right now as we're talking in this world, in this room. But right now we don't see it. So we believe that it's there. When the sea split, what happened with the sea is the Jewish people were able to see the spirituality. Because they... God revealed what was under the sea at the same time he showed them the spirituality. Now you can say what that means that they actually saw the word of God or the spiritual signs of what was happening. 
That I don't know. But they definitely saw that, hey, we always thought that God was the one, so that, 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 that the seed just flows. We always just thought that nature runs by itself. What did God show them? I don't just take water and just do something to it. But the truth is, I was controlling the water when it was just regular water. When the waves flashed against the ocean, I was, I was controlling that little drop. Every single drop, exactly how it splashed, I was controlling that. And therefore, really, if I wanted to, I could make it stand up. But I don't want to create a world that things don't run in a natural way. I want the world to run in a natural way. But know that sometimes it will seem as though naturally things are happening that you may not like or that you shouldn't, but know that God is always behind it. So that's why, as I said, I'm only going to focus on these two points because there's so much more that we can talk about, but I want to focus on the, a, a whole other half of this concept. That's why uh, these two points where we see the, the change within the natural world and the revelation of the spirituality behind the natural world, of godliness within the natural world, that's why the spring of the sea becomes this most significant event. Now, I want, to sh I want to go in for a moment to the text, and I want to show you, and I want to connect it back to the, spirit, the special day of Yud Shvat. Okay? Now, I'm actually going to open up... Oh no, don't tell me that one. Oops. No. Whoops, whoops, whoops. I had it opened. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> sure. I thought maybe when my wife signed me in, she uh, got it. Got it. So what did I open? I opened it up to the reading for Wednesday, the reading of the spinning of the sea. And I wanted to actually show you something and, and try to show you what I think is the connection. Um, are you able to see my, see my screen? Yeah, you're on a Facebook screen. And, uh, no ah, whoops, whoops. No, 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 we'll do that again. It went to the wrong one. Okay. Okay, could you see my screen now? Okay, so the Jewish people are being chased, and God says to Moshe, Go and stretch out your hand on the sea. Moses, Moses, stretch out your heart. And, um, and he says, Over Egypt and over its chariots, Moshe stretches out his hand, and um, the, it says, This is talking about what happens afterwards. That the, the sea returns back down, and the uh, the Egyptians were now in the sea on dry land, and they the it says how Egypt and Pharaoh were chasing after them, and they all died in as the sea as they were chasing off the Jewish people, and meantime the Jewish people are um, walking along on, in the sea in dry land, and it says over here. I'm not going to go through all this inside. I wanted to focus on one or two lines as we're coming up to. It says the Jewish children went on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the water was like them, like a wall from the right and from the left. Okay. Now, this is all, by the way, part of our daily davening. It says that the Jews, the Lord saved the Jewish people from the hand of Egypt, and the, the Jewish people then, when they came out, they saw... The Egyptians dead on the side. Now look what it says as well. Vayar Yisrael is a yad hagdola asher asashem b'Mitzrayim. The Jewish people saw the great hand of Moshe, sorry, the hand of God in Egypt. And look what it says afterwards. The next words are Vayiro ha'amet Hashem. And the beer, the people feared because they had seen God. They feared God. Now, what does it say? Before the Jewish people believed in God, they, they believed in Hashem, believed in Moshe. But then, by Amina Bashem and Moshe Abdom, after such a miracle, now it tells us that they believed in Hashem. In other words, this had strengthened or 
made certain their belief in Hashem more than the plagues. But then it says something strange and says of a Moshe Avdo and Moses his servant. Now that seems strange because we believe in God. We don't believe in Moses. As Jewish people, are we supposed to believe in Moshe? Are we supposed to believe in God? Now it's interesting. Some people say that the Haggadah doesn't say Moshe's name in it. If you look at the Haggadah, which we say on the on the Pesach night, it doesn't say Hashem, the, the, it only says Hashem. And some people say, oh, it's come to tell us that we shouldn't have intermediaries and shouldn't think, uh, give Moshe the... Uh, we shouldn't give Moshe the, the so to speak, the... Uh, what's the right? The credit. We shouldn't give Moshe the credit for what happened at the Exodus and the spring of the sea. And somebody came to this to, to the Rebbe and said, ask, ask the Rebbe, why is it that Moshe's name is not in the Haggadah? And the Rebbe answered that Moshe's name is in the Haggadah. Now it could be that some customs don't have this. There's slight different customs. But most customs actually have it. It says, it says Moshe's name once. When does it say it? Right over here. It says that they believed in Moshe, in Hashem, and Moshe his servant. Now why is this, why is this important? The Zohar tells us no, sorry, I saw you. I'm really just up. Did you want to say something? No, you, you finish what you're going to say. I'm doing. No, no, go on, and then I'll, I'll then I'll get into what I want to say. Okay. So to me, it seems that it is uh, logical that they believe in Moshe, because uh, when he comes to you as a as a uh, slave, and he says, "You follow me, and I'll get you out of here, and uh, God will take you and deliver you from this country and suffering." So maybe it was hard for them to believe that, that, that there's some supernatural or, or powerful, all-powerful God behind it. So they're looking at Moshe in disbelief, and he, he, he kind of made their life harder at the beginning. So now that he's standing there overlooking the sea and everything that he's saying comes true, and he seems to be the one speaking with Hashem and He's not controlling Hashem, but he's their intermediary. And he says, you go through the sea, you'll be fine, and the sea parts. So t to me, uh, it seems uh, logical for them to believe in him. Not believe that he's God, but believe in him, that he can lead them out of slavery. So okay. maybe they're not worshipping him, but they have faith in him. Very good, very good. Um, I I'll just say, I'll okay, good. I'll, I'll tell you why, um, and I, I think that some people like to th believe um, that when you have... Uh, okay, let me take, sorry, take, take this a step back. In the early years of the Hasidic movement, one of the major differences that the Hasidic movement had is that they had groups of Hasidim of people, individuals, and they had a Rebbe. Now, this was something which was um, not common in that particular era. So, what people would have is they would have a rabbi. The Rebbe was that this man became their guide and their leader in how, in, 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 so to speak, they felt very connected to them as an individual. They connected to this person as an individual and as though this individual was going to show them and teach them how to connect to Hashem. That was one of the things. Hasidism has two elements, has, has, has lots of elements to it. We don't have time to discuss everything that Hasidism offers. One thing is a set of, of teachings and ways of life. That's one element to Hasidism. The other concept was a connection to a particular tremendous righteous person, a tzaddik who we refer to as a Rebbe, a Rebbe. The Hasidic movement introduced a Rebbe. Now, one of the great oppositions, or one of the concepts that the people that opposed the early Hasidim, and till this day, some people struggle with this concept, 
was how could you go and ask your Rebbe to give you a blessing? You should be davening only to Hashem. You should just say 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 to him. How could you connect to a, a Rebbe? And how can you put your trust in a Rebbe to to be guiding you, so to speak, and uh, making as though they have the way to connect you to Hashem more than anybody else, so to speak, more than any other Rabbi. And this was one of the great oppositions. Till this day, people have struggled with this concept. Because why? Why do they struggle with it? Because they say, the Torah says, that we're not allowed to have any intermediaries between us and Hashem. And we know that, and we also have another fear, that if we start to have, so to speak, this person that we consider our intermediary, we might look a little bit Christian because the Christians have their Messiah or their leaders sorry my son just needs something okay close the door please so we, we have this certain fear of if we consider a person to be our spiritual guide and we ask them for blessings to bless us and to pray on our behalf it's though why aren't we going directly to God it's as though there's an intermediary and that seems to oppose an old Jewish tradition so this was one of the issues that the Hasidic movement had so what is the answer to this concept the answer to the concept was that a Rebbe was never supposed to be an intermediary that blocks, it's an intermediary that connects. Let me explain what to you the difference. If you have two rivers, or two, sorry, two pieces of dry land, and you have a river flowing in the middle, and you have a bridge that connects the two, that bridge is an intermediary between the two pieces of the dry land. It's an added on piece. But if you, so we said the concept of Hasidism was not like a bridge. So what was it like? It was more like a knot. The Rebbe is the one tying the knot. He doesn't act as an intermediary that separates the two and brings them together but he acts as simply the one that brings the two forces together. And this is, it's a subtle difference, but a major difference. Where does this concept come from? Sorry, let me just clarify that in case it wasn't, it wasn't clear. The difference between a knot and a bridge is a knot, it just takes two things which are part, one and the same thing, and it ties them together and you have an outside so to speak thing that's tying those two things and showing that divine that that that, that connection that that was inherent and ties the two together and that creates the knot but there's nothing new there's nothing added on as opposed to a bridge you have two separate beings and you have something in between them so we say that the Rebbe's job is not to be a bridge. The job, Rebbe's not job is to be a knot tire. He's supposed to show how we and God are really one and the same thing. Now, who, where does this concept come from? It comes from the Torah, from Moshe Rabbein, from Moses. And we see this right over here. The source of this is from here. It tells us that when you believe in God, the way that you have and you form that connection with God, we as human beings, we're standing down here. And as I mentioned, what was what, what are we? We're the Jewish people before the sea splits. What are the Jewish people before the Jewish people sits? We look at the sea, what do we see? We don't see anything under the sea. We see no spirituality. We see no connection to the spiritual world, to God. We don't see God. We don't see how us in this physical world can to connect to God. We see God as being far and distant and removed from our lives. 
and not connected. The job of the Rebbe is to show us, hold on, actually, to split the sea. And I'll show you that within your physical world, I'll see that God is controlling nature. God, God is in your, in your life, in your body, part of your soul. If you look at all the teachings of the Rebbe, they're all about splitting the sea. They're all about revealing that godliness inside of you. That's why when Moshe splits the sea, when he causes the splitting of the sea, so to speak, to happen, what does he do? He reveals the godliness within the mundane. He shows the Jewish people how you look. Till now, you looked at this as this foreign god outside the world that can, you know, do magic to the world. But he's not involved in the world. He's not there for you to connect. The job of Moshe Rabbeinu is to show how God is part of our lives, is in our lives, and we could connect to him. So, let me, let me take this a step further. The Zohar says as follows. So you've heard of the Zohar. The Zohar was written about um, 1900 years ago by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the great student of Rabbi Akiva. And the Tsar was is, is considered the main and most important or the primary Kabbalistic work. And is well accepted by all of Jewry and has been for many a century, although not everyone learned it for, for numerous reasons. But one thing that the Tsar says is that Yesh Eshpastusa the Moshe Bechol Dora. There's a Moses in every generation. Now, Moses, there's one Moshe Rabbeinu. Moses is unique, and in our previous discussions, when we spoke about, we, in the previous, Moshe Rabbeinu was different to all other leaders. But tonight, we're going to focus on what is the same between Moshe Rabbeinu and all other major Jewish leaders. Okay? Moshe Rabbeinu, because the, the Zohar says there's Ishpashtusa. What is Ishpashtusa? Ishpashtusa is an Aramaic term. The Zohar is written in Aramaic. It means there is an offshoot of Moshe in every generation. Now there's Moshe Rabbeinu, his soul. In spiritual leader of that generation. And therefore, that individual is the person that we should connect to. And that person is the individual that will guide us and help us to know how we can formulate and split the sea, so to speak. Find the godliness in our lives, break those barriers and show us what is hidden beneath the sea. Show our connection with God in our particular times. Okay? So that's what Moshe, the, the, the Zohar says. It's got, a, a, it's got a long discussion about that. And it says one other, other thing. One of the, it says, what's the job of Moshe Rabbeinu? So we're told the job of, of, of the Moses of the generation is to give da'as to the people, to give them knowledge. What's knowledge? Knowledge of their innate connection to God. I think uh, I'm frozen. Oh, no. oh, uh, I think it's yeah, it's uh, it's Mundo. Yeah. 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 Hi, Joe. Hi, everyone else. Hi, Matt. Uh, hey, Leon. Hey, Leon. Uh, Zach. Hey, Leon. <laughs> hey, Leon. Hey. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Hi, hey, Leon. Everybody. Hey, Wanna. Hey, uh, Jochen. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I came in late, but uh, here I am now. Yeah, very good. Excellent. Good to see you, Leon.
Hey, uh, Leon, it's okay. We were talking about splitting the C, but I think we split the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm back on. Sorry. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. I lost yeah. internet connection, something. My internet just blocked out. But, uh, I suppose it happens. Apologies. It got you time to all wake up. There you go. Woke you up. It was all good. Came in a good time. Um, so, what I think, in, what's unique about the Rebbe is that I think that in a certain way he was more involved in the general Jewish world more than almost any other leader since the time of Moshe because he was the first major spiritual Jewish leader in the modern era so to speak where the world became more connected um, and we've had other great leaders like this but ever since the time of Joshua and temple times, since really temple times, the Jewish people have been very dispersed. And while we've had great leaders, but their leader, they, they usually focused on a particular area. And there was always the espashtusa de Moshe, like we know that, that the Rebbe's final talk, by the way, that he gave out was on this concept, on, on that offshoot of Moshe in every generation. And he talks about how his predecessor, the previous Rebbe, was the offshoot of of the of the the motion that generation and he talks about how Mordechai in the Purim story was also the obvious offshoot of Moshe in their generation and the fact that he says that it seems quite obvious that he's also implying that he himself is also that concept his, his predecessor was he doesn't say that about himself but we as Christians understood that it also implies that we know that there was one individual that cared and was involved with Jewry throughout the world more than anybody else. Um, I would say possibly since the time of, of Moses, definitely since the Temple era, definitely since the Temple era, there were other great and significant rabbis in a sense like, you know, the, the rabbis of the Mishnah, um, like Rebbe, that even though he was focused in one area, but his teaching spread out. And Rambam, for, without a doubt, Rambam and Rashi, two of the great leaders, that their teaching spread out. But, you know, it's, it's no secret that the Rebbe felt that it was his duty to make sure that every single place, no matter where it is on planet Earth, there would be a Jewish community and, and, and somebody there to take care of the Jewish needs. No one in history has done such a thing. So, if anybody, in my opinion, and I don't think it's just my opinion, I think it's fact, but I don't want to, you know, <laughs> be too pushy about it, just in case anybody has an issue with it. But if anybody were to think, who is the Moshe Rabbein with in our generation, it's without a doubt the Rebbe, in the last, and if there's ever been an individual that was that person that has helped individuals reconnect to God, in a generation coming after the most devastating event in all of history of the Holocaust and he came and reconnected Jews and felt found Jews no matter where they were in every single corner and found a way to reconnect them and make them connect to Judaism uh, with you know f over 5,000 Jewish institutions uh, Chabad institutions in every single corner of the world for certain that was the Rebbe and when you when we study the teachings of the Rebbe, he's got one job, and that's to show us, and he says it, is to show us how we are one and connected to God. Is that not that we tie? He's just there to connect us and show us how we and God have always and will always be one. We're two, we're, we're one and the same thing. So. What I've said till now, I thought would take me about 25 minutes, but I'm a slow speaker, so it's taken me 55 minutes. You know, it, on the other hand, we got uh, Zach Gomer over there when he gives a talk, when he prepares something that would, would take me an hour and a half, he's able to say it in 20 minutes. <laughs> Less is not necessarily more. <laughs> not necessarily more. Anyway. Well, what I was hoping to do for the second half of our talk, and I say it's already 
I was hoping that we would just go through a few as I mentioned at the beginning this the splitting of the sea is known as the miracle of miracles it's the miracle the historical miracle it's the representation of all major miracles are represented by the splitting of the sea so therefore I thought I would just say a few famous stories of the Rebbe in honor of the special day. So if you have a glass of Lachaim, I forgot to prepare myself a Lachaim, if you have a little vodka next to you or a whiskey or even a cold glass of water, let's say Lachaim. And I'll 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 I'll, I'll take a, a thirty second break and sing a short song that the Rebbe taught. The song is Tomalacha Nafshi. It's uh, one of the most famous songs that the Rebbe said, and this is from Psalms. And the song says, nafshi, my, song yearn, my soul yearns for you. Sorry, my flesh is, is coming up in a arid sea, in a dry land, and dry and tired land, without any water. Then it says, Kain ba Kodesh Chazi Sicha. So in holiness we will see you to see your power. There is Uzcha and your and your glory. Now I, I, I don't want to start Googling this because I didn't prepare this, but I thought it's appropriate that before we say a story, we should just sing a short song. So if you know the Samalacha Nafshi song of the Rebbe, as I said, there's a video, plenty of videos. When you see the Rebbe sing it, it's something special. Goes like this. Tzama lecha nafshi Koma lecha besori Vyeres iyo veyo yaiv Belim oyim Didi ya 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 I'm going to take a moment and just show you a quick video of the Rebbe singing it. Sorry, I'm just going to share my screen. The song that the Rebbe actually taught the Hasidim. And then we will call the official program over and anybody that wants to stay along to hear a few stories is welcome to. Can you hear me? Oh, <laughs> 
Okay, you were able to see that? Yeah? All right, it's uh, uh, just a shorter version. It's, um, will you see that high part, Kain Ba Kodesh Chazi Sikha, that's one of the, the Rebbe taught us 10 famous songs, and that's probably the most famous song that the Rebbe taught. And um, I think it, in a certain way, it narrows down what the Rebbe was trying to teach us, that as people we're trying to yearn for holiness and for spirituality and connection with God. But really, when we connect to our holiness, to our souls, to our and, and to the Torah, and to each other, then we find godliness and spirituality inside of us. And that's really deeper, the whole, that in a nutshell could sum up all of the Rebbe's teaching. So it's nine o'clock. That's, uh, I suppose, the, 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 the lead up to the sheer part of the Favrangan. I wanted to discuss how there's this beautiful connection between the day of Yud Shvat and the splitting of the sea. That on the reading of Yud Shvat, of the day that the Rebbe became ready, we have this special, unique thing where we see that when we believe in God, we also believe in God's emissary to us. And by believing in Him, we're not taking away from our belief in God. It's not in place of our belief in God. But it actually strengthens our connection to Hashem. That's the belief in the Rebbe. And that's in the very reading of the splitting of the sea, in the reading of tomorrow. And just to say something else that's fascinating. Always the week of the Rebbe's passing, the Rebbe passed away on Gimel Tammuz, the third of Tammuz. The Torah reading every single year of the third of Tammuz is the Torah reading of Korach. And what's famous about Korach is that he wanted, he said, I believe in God and believe in everything, but he wanted to rebel against Moshe. And that's the tremendous, uh, and then he gets swallowed up by the, uh, the, the earth swallows him up. So, uh, uh, Rabbi, can you repeat what you just said? Because you froze and I didn't hear what you said. Okay, thank you. Um, I said the story by the Rebbe's passing, the Torah reading is the Torah reading of Korach. And the story of Korach is an individual that believes in God, but he doesn't believe in Moshe. And he believes that Moshe is, is, is making things up on his own accord. And what happens to him on that week is he gets swallowed up by earth. So I think it's quite incredible how the day that the Rebbe becomes Rebbe is connected to the splitting of the sea. And it talks about belief in Hashem and the belief in Moshe, that the two go together. We believe in Hashem. Of course, that's the primary, that's what it means to be a Jew. You could still be a Jew without believing in Moshe, but it almost equates them when it talks about the one time that the Jewish people believed in, in, in Hashem, it also says that they believed in Moshe. His servant and the other element is what I was saying is that when people rebel against you could rebel against you could say I believe in Hashem but when you rebel against the Moshe of the generation then I don't think great things happen as we see in the week of the, the passing of the Rebbe which is the third of Tammuz the reading of Korach so I wanted to, to, to mention a few famous stories, and I mentioned before how the Rebbe is the, the leader of the Jewish people in our generation, the leader of our generation, and how he's connected to the Jews in every single place. So I'll tell you an, an Australian connected story to start off with. Has anybody heard of Professor Hasofer? Okay, Professor Asofer was an individual, he was a Israeli professor that uh, moved to Tasmania in the early 70s and the story occurred with him. He was a secular Israeli professor, he had no Jewish knowledge, very little Jewish knowledge. Um, and he moved there, he got a position in, I think, the University of Tasmania, whichever university it was. 
So the story occurred with him. And the other individual in the story is Rabbi Gutnik. The late Rabbi Gutnik, who was the previous rabbi, the father of Rabbi Motel and Rabbi, and, and rabbi Yossel Gutnik. Um, so his name was Rabbi Chaim Gutnik, one of, Aust one of Melbourne's greatest uh, great rabbis. Anyway, Rabbi Chaim Gutnik, one day, I believe this was in the 70s or the 80s, gets, receives a phone call from the Rebbe's office. And the phone call, he's told he should go take a plane to Tasmania. Get on a plane from Melbourne to Tasmania. And that's it. That's the only instructions he was given. By the way, these type of instructions were commonplace. Somebody, I'll tell you if, 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 if anybody wants to sit down afterwards for any more stories. Um, so he gets on a, on, on a plane to Tasmania and he has no clue where to go. Gets at the plane and he takes a taxi and says, take me to town. And he gets off and he has no idea where to go. And he steps out of the taxi and starts walking down the road with his hat and his briefcase. And as he starts walking down the road, suddenly a man runs over to him and says, Rabbi, 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 hello, 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 welcome, welcome. How did you know that I've been looking for you? And he, Rabbi Gutnik says, well, I immediately realized that the Rebbe <laughs> didn't have to give me any more instructions. He would organize everything to work out. Anyway. The man, the the, uh, the gentleman says, "Hi, welcome. My name is Professor Hasofer, and I've been looking for a rabbi. I'm so glad that you're here. Do you mind if I talk to you?" He says, "Sure." So Professor Hasofer invited Rabbi Gutnik into his house, and Professor Hasofer told the following to Rabbi Gutnik. He said, "I." I um, uh, was brought up in a very secular home, uh, very academic, and I was offered a position here in the University of Tasmania, and uh, I thought, you know, moving to Australia sounded good, took the, uh, took the position, and I've been living here for a few years. A couple of years after I had moved here, the small community in Tasmania found out that there was an Israeli professor, and they called me up and they said, you know, we have a small synagogue over here. Um, but unfortunately, none of us know how to really read Hebrew or how to lead the prayers. And we assume that as an Israeli, you would know how to pray and to read Hebrew. So can you please come over to our synagogue and lead the prayers? So he said, well, listen, I've never read plays before. I don't know how to lead the prayers. But they said, do you know how to read Hebrew? He said, yes. He said, okay, that's all we need. Just come and read the Hebrew prayer book. So he came one Shabbos and he read some Hebrew from the Siddur and then came closer to Rosh Hashanah and they said, oh, please, will you read the, lead the prayers for Rosh Hashanah? And he started trying to find out, trying to learn, looking through the Machzor, and he put something together. And it was a short while later that he said like he was getting more involved in this community. He had no religious interest or background prior to that. And he literally really didn't know anything much about Judaism, other than knowing how to read Hebrew. And one day he prays and he says, God, I want to help this community. I'm the only one that learns and knows how to read Hebrew. Please, please God, send me somebody that can teach me how to lead the services and how to help and guide our community here in Tasmania. He says, I made that prayer yesterday and the next day you showed up as if sent from heaven now the story goes on this professor so far ended up learning uh, with Rabbi Gutnik a lot and, and kept becoming very connected he ended up becoming a Chabadnik himself he actually uh, wrote books and the Rebbe got him to write different, different articles this professor became very religious um, uh, actually, his wife died a pastor at a young age, and he remarried to a, a an African American uh, convert, a wonderful lady that was very close with my uh, grandmother. Her name was Abigail, who recently passed away. 
um, Abigail the Sofer. Um, so that's one story of when a person prays to God. Who hears that cry, so to speak? The Rebbe heard, and from America, he never said it to, never wrote anything, he never told them from America somehow. The Rebbe heard. The Rebbe never heard. He's that way connected with every single Jew. The Rebbe, the word for Rebbe is Rosh B'nai Yisrael, which means head of the Jewish people. And we believe that God has all the Jewish people are like one body. And then there's a particular individual in the generation that he's like the head. And the head feels all that is going on within the rest of the body. And they're able to feel what's going on with other people. By the way, there's thousands of such stories. I'll just tell you another one that comes to mind. There's a rabbi named Rabbi First. He's the um, he's the head shliach, the head chabad rabbi in Holland. And once he gets a a phone call from the rabbi's secretary, and it's just before Pesach. And the rabbi's secretary says, "The rabbi wants you to go to this to this particular town." And it was like some far off town, little, you know, Holland's not that big, but relatively like outlandish town that like no one believed any Jews that lived there. And that was it. He didn't tell them where in that town, just to that town. And go there with some access. And Rabbi First says he went there, he went for a few days, and he drove around from place to place to place. He never had the same luck like Rabbi Gutnik, where where he immediately found his answer. He had the opposite story. He drove from place to place to place. And he spent a couple of days there. And everywhere he went, he said, do anybody know any Jews? He would go from store to store, street by street, looking for Jews. And nobody knew of anybody Jewish in the town. And after a few days, it was getting very close to Pesach. He didn't know what to do. He felt really bad because he knew that the Rebbe had sent him and he knew there was a reason why the Rebbe sent him. But he felt like he had to go home. So he starts heading back home, and just before he leaves the town and he fills up in petrol, or fills up his petrol in that town, he decides at the petrol station, let me ask about a Jewish person, last opportunity, before I leave town. And in the petrol station he says, he sees a person that does not look at all Jewish, and he says, do you know anybody Jewish? And the guy actually, the way he tells the story, looked quite scary. As in, like, you know, not the type of person you want to mess with. And he says, just oh, please wait here. And he was afraid maybe this was a dangerous person that was an Iberian anti anti -Sema. The guy walked inside, came back, and he says, please come inside. And he said, he went inside, and he sees an old man, an elderly man over there, an old-ish man. And the man sees him and starts crying. And he says, are you a rabbi? He said, yes. He says, how did you know to come here? He says, I was sent. He says, let me tell you something. I, as far as I know, I am the only Jewish person that I know in this town. I don't know anybody else and I am close with the local priest and the local priest has for years been telling me to join the other people and convert you know you're a lone Jew just convert and I always believed that a Jew shouldn't convert to Christianity but having not seen another Jew for so long and feeling like totally lost after the Holocaust and and everything I felt you know what I might have just convert at least I could be part of a community feel part of a community and I said to God if you don't send me a sign by this particular date I will convert to Christianity he said rabbi today is the last day I gave I gave God a certain amount of days to show me a sign whether I should convert he said you came today and you saved me from converting And Rabbi First says he gave him matzah, 
and then he ended up inviting him to come back to uh, to Amsterdam, where his chabad where his shul is, and, and they they reconnected and, and were able. There's there's many many such type of stories, but what this shows us is that we believe we feel as though we have you know knowledge of what's going on somehow God knows exactly what's happening within our lives he's very involved in every single detail just like we said with the spinning of the sea it looks like everything is not running, running natural but the truth is that it's not God is involved in every detail and he's listening to everything that is happening and he's watching everything that we do and in honor of the spinning of the sea being great miracles I want to tell you one of my favorite I'll conclude with one final miracle story as I said if anybody wants to go please go I want to conclude with one uh, final miracle story this as I said there's thousands that I know and I've heard literally thousands throughout the years but I want to tell you my favorite miracle story of the Rebbe that there's actually a video on Chabad.org of the person saying it but I didn't I didn't uh, look for it so I'll tell you the story I think the person's name is Mr. Weiss that says this is a I believe he's a Chabad individual and the story is that um, when he before he got married which I believe was in the 70s he went for he at the time was not Chabad but he Sorry, I believe he had a connection to Chabad and his wife, his wife to be, did not. But they, the custom at the time was that a bride and groom, if they were, you know, Chabad or connected to Chabad, before they got married, they would go in for a private audience with the Rebbe, a private visit meeting with the Rebbe to get blessings for their new marriage. And sometimes, the, we know the custom is that the week before the wedding, generally bride and groom don't see each other but sometimes that's when these meetings happened so he said it was during that week before the wedding and I went with my wife to be my fiance for the wedding for our me meeting with the Rebbe and the meeting went we got our blessings our discussions and uh, relatively short and then a few minutes into the uh, the audience the my wife starts crying and she asks the Rebbe if I if he can please ask me the groom to leave and the Rebbe said ask me to leave anyway that was it they didn't speak to each other till after the wedding a few days later and he says the first thing I asked my wife after you know you go with the way it works is you have the chuppah the canopy and then you go into a private room afterwards and then that consecrates the, the, the marriage when we went into what's called the yuchud room the first thing I asked is tell me what did you I haven't stopped thinking what did you want to talk to the Rebbe why did you ask the Rebbe to, to, to take me out of the room so he says I'll tell you he says I told the Rebbe that I don't think I should get married I don't think I'm good marriage material because I have a terrible temper and I get angry very easily and I'm going to get angry at my husband and he's not going to want to stay married to me and I don't think I should get married and I'm asking the Rebbe what he thinks I should do so the so so he says so what did the Rebbe tell you so the Rebbe said you should go along you go ahead with the wedding and don't worry about getting angry or losing your patience because you're going to have lots of children and children force us to learn patience and how not to lose our temper and how not to get angry <laughs> they test us okay great anyway they're a young religious couple in the 70s and um, you know we don't most of us don't wait to you know till we're ready to have children after we get married we usually start trying to have children straight away he says it was about you know a year into our marriage and we had not had a child yet so we decided to go to a doctor we went to a doctor 
and the doctor said listen it's only been a year maybe come back in a you know try a bit more longer and if uh, if it still doesn't work come back to me in another six six to eight months anyway eight months later we came back to the doctor we can try another eight months no success so the doctor says okay we're going to be doing a whole bunch of tests um, it could be quite invasive so be ready but you know for us having children was extremely important my wife was really worried so we started going through the tests with very short, quickly the doctor called us over called us back to his office and he said unfortunately I have really bad news for you he said um, he said to my wife you have a very rare disease which basically is, I don't know the term, but basically you have what's called an infantile womb, which is basically a womb that is impossible for it to harbor a fetus. A child cannot go into it, and cannot grow in it, and it's impossible for you to have a child. Naturally, there is absolutely no way whatsoever for anything that we can do about it. Your womb is just not capable of having a child, and you have no chance. And I know this is really upsetting as your religious people and to religious people it's considered uh, a really important part of your life to have children but unfortunately that's just not a possibility and as you can imagine this couple when they heard it they were quite devastated they've been trying they were unsuccessful and now the doctor confirmed that there was no chance so what was the first thing they did they called the Rebbe they said hold on a second the Rebbe told she says, when I went into that with that private audience, the Rebbe said that I was going to have children. And that was going to teach me patience. The Rebbe said that. So she called the Rebbe secretary. And she told the, the Rebbe secretary the story. And she also said, the Rebbe told us and told me, my private audience, that we have we're going to have children. And the secretary said, if the Rebbe said you're going to have children, you're going to have children. And she said, okay. And she accepted it. And she decided that despite what the doctor said, that naturally it's impossible for us to have a child, we're going to have children. And she says, that within a very short amount of time, they became pregnant. She became pregnant. And she had one child, she had two child children, and I believe she had 15 children. 15 children. After they had their last child, and I think she was already older and already in had reached the age of menopause, and she went to a doctor to do some tests. Um, to check some things that were going on they went to another specialist that didn't necessarily know all of their history know that they had had children and the doctor did some tests on her and the doctor came back and said wow and said I just want to say I noticed that you look like a very religious couple I see that you have a beard and you dress like a religious couple I'm sure it must have been really difficult not to have any children as a Jewish religious couple because naturally you could never have had children because you have an infantile womb as came up in the recent x-ray that we just did and she says she never said a word to the doctor she just started laughing and left the room because she thought that the miracle was that uh, because through the blessing of the Rebbe her womb had changed from being an inf infantile womb to an infantile womb and, and had gone away but no thereafter she confirmed that she had actually never got rid of the infantile womb that infantile womb somehow was able to grow and somehow was remained an infantile womb and was able to have 15 healthy children and every single one of those children was an absolute miracle absolutely against nature in their understanding anyway so that's the splitting of the sea story for me one of my, my favorite favorite miracle Rebbe story there's lots there's as I say there's thousands of them 
for that for, for me because sometimes when we do things that naturally are how did the Rebbe know she was going to have children I don't know but whatever it was sometimes things don't work the way we think they're supposed to but ultimately everything is divine guided by Hashem in every single way and uh, on this special evening it's a great opportunity to find a way to connect to the Rebbe in our time of Chabad we have a custom that we say part of the discourse of the Rebbe's uh, the previous Rebbe's uh, last discourse and we write a letter to the Rebbe um, and we farbrang so this was our farbrangin and uh, I want to wish everybody on this special day that you should be blessed with revealed and open miracles in your life with health and livelihood and uh, good relationships shalom buy it and every with all your children and health all your, your, your family and children whoever you need and uh, only good things for all the days of your life please God l'chaim l'chaim and some people would say good yantif thank you l'chaim thank you 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 for joining you a good job to rabbi thank you thank you